this is a uh, conversation based on uh, the reliability of mechanistic evidence in decision making when out data is not a base generated based on such evidence. Um, this stemmed out of a discussion on Twitter between Chris Master John and Nick Hybert, who is uh, using a BRB waffles over here. Um, and if you could catch everyone up to speed, Chris and uh, Nick, on uh, what you two are disagreeing about, and then we can have a discussion. I think maybe we can shed some light on this. And uh, because we do have a lot of people in here who are interested in philosophy, who especially and epistemology and philosophy of science. So I think this conversation should be fruitful, and hopefully we can get some clarity on the issue. Whichever one cool. wants to go first. Well, I'll just. I'll just say, I think that we should probably just start from square one at, and sort of discuss first principles of how we gain confidence, because I think that Nick and I are in pretty much complete agreement about um, the sort of how to determine high confidence in cause and effect things. I think where our disagreement lies is mostly in when we don't have high confidence in cause and effect relationships, how do we decide what to do? And um, so I imagine that conversation would sort of clarify where that disagreement is and where the agreement is. Anything to add to that, Nick? Uh, no, that sounds good to me. All right, cool. So what? So if you're both on the same page on that, because I think you're, I don't think you're disagreeing about. I don't think Nick doesn't understand that um, the distinction between. I obviously there's a distinction between your confidence on what cause and effect is. And well, there's three things to really always clarify. There's your point estimate. There's the direction of there's the direction of what your estimate is. There's the magnitude of what your, your estimate is. So the mac, the effect size and then the confidence that you have, and then there's the decision. Those things are different. Issues. So, we well, I, I I think I would I would um I would sort of agree with that if you have all that data, but I think it's extremely clear that most of us make almost all of our decisions without having any of that data. Yeah, we there's a lot of sometimes there's ambiguity or there's intuition. No, sometimes you don't have a point estimate, but you still have yeah, to do yeah something. for sure yeah point estimate, but you have to do something, and so um. Or, or at the very least, you have some kind of intuition about where you think the point estimate's going to be with, with a lot of vague, vague um, but you don't actually have a point estimate. Agreed. Yeah. So, so it seems like we're in one of these areas here with nutrition and COVID where you have a lot of, you don't really, you don't, you definitely don't have a point estimate. And if you do, it's less than other than intuition. And then there's, you, you could kind of, I don't even want to use the word, I'm not even sure if I want to use the word speculate, but um, you kind of have an intuition about where you think the point estimate's going to be. There's a lot of vagueness around that point estimate. And then there's the confidence that you, you have about where that vagueness is. And then, and, and then there's the issue of, do we make recommendations on this when we have to have some form of action? Um, if we have to have some form of action. And so that's where I think the conversation is. And I think both, I think everyone here understands that, all three of us, right? I mean, Nick, you, I think you're on the same page on this, right? Oh, yeah, absolutely. Okay, yeah, so then... I, yeah, I, yeah I, think, I, I think we are, we're on the same page on the principles that you laid out. And I think the disagreement is, is mostly sort of like when you lack the confidence what do you recommend or do you not recommend? And I think, I think my impression is that a lot of the disagreement is, you know, is there sort of like one, one size fits all standard for when it's right to recommend something, or would you apply different standards according to your degree of confidence and according to who you are? So, for example, I think that it is very reasonable for private individuals to say, I think this will happen. And therefore what I would do in this situation until further evidence is this. And if you're interested in doing it and following my approach, then I would recommend that you do it like this or this or this. And I think that might be very reasonable in a context such as this, 
Whereas it might be extremely unreasonable for an institution that represents scientific consensus like the CDC to make those same recommendations. Okay, so wait, there's a so that adds a different layer of this. So you're saying there's a distinction between private and division in making recommendations. You want to say that again? I think you garbled up for a second. Oh, sorry. So I, it seems like there's another layer to this. So it seems like in addition to that, um, in addition to that, there's a distinction between in these in this context, there's a distinction between a private individual making recommendations versus an institution making recommendations. I make that distinction. I, I'm not sure that Nick agrees with. Do you agree with the distinction, Nick? Uh, let, let me th- let me think about it. Uh, re- restate it for a second. You're gonna have to bear with me. I did not get a lot of sleep last night. Okay, should I restate it or should Avi you should, restate? You should restate it, Chris. It's your distinction. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, so I let me back up and and just kind of say what I think generally. Um, so the way that I see this is that a large institution that represents scientific consensus has a responsibility to achieve a very high level of confidence in what they're saying for numerous reasons that not only include the fact that they have a reputation as representing scientific consensus, but also the fact that large numbers of people will rely on sound bites derived from their positions to put into action with very little questioning. So I think when you when you or the same thing could be said of medical protocols. When you have a protocol where it's going to determine what everyone is doing who has responsibility for treating patients, and they might do that in the context in, you, you can predict that many of them will largely just consult the protocol as if it represents consensus. You have a responsibility to have a very high level of, of uh, confidence in a position that there would be relatively little disagreement in the field about. Whereas if you don't bear the responsibility of representing scientific consensus, you have a lot of freedom to decide when uh, when you when you think it is reasonable to say something about what someone should do in some circumstance. And there's a lot of latitude there because the value of when to act on what level of confidence is a completely subjective value. So if I prefer to uh, do what I think has even a slightly higher probability of having a positive effect versus uh, do something negative, because I think that the sort of effect size of the downside risk is something I'm willing to tolerate, then that's my decision. And so what what determines the the ethics of whether I share that is whether I share it accurately in a non-misleading way to clarify what my confidence is and what I think the potential risks are. Um, and so I think that the, um, I think the latitude that, uh, not even just a private individual, but anyone that doesn't have a reputation and responsibility to represent scientific consensus, um, I, then I think there's an enormous amount of latitude to decide what type of actions to take on what type of information. I mean, I suppose, I, but it just seems to me that within that latitude, there is a significant margin for error that doesn't seem like it, it, it's it's almost an intolerable margin for error because you can pretty much just justify whatever you want, um, you know. And if your ethical criteria is that you're completely transparent about it, there are plenty of unethical things that somebody could do, you know, provided they're. Uh, try, that they could be transparent about. So I I don't know. I don't see that as particularly. Could you, could you give an Could you give an example of that? Well, I mean, somebody can go to a drug dealer for heroin, and the drug dealer could tell you this is heroin. It doesn't make it an ethical transaction. Okay. Um, <laughs> okay, that's true. Uh, but I, I think we're not talking about that type of thing. Um, like the distinction I'm, I'm making is not that anything is ethical as long as you're transparent. Like that's obviously false. The distinction that I'm making is that the level of confidence required to make a decision for yourself is completely subjective. And the 
I mean, the level of confidence in a decision to do something that is ethical or completely neutral towards ethics, um, it it doesn't become unethical to do that thing with less confidence that it will work when you are very transparent about not having that confidence. Like that's a completely different topic from being transparent about doing something unethical. All right, Chris, I just want to get that distinction down. So I hear that the distinction here is that it's a subjective, the decision for whether something is more likely to be helpful or harmful is a subjective decision. Is that, What's the symmetry breaker there between that and the heroin case? Like, let's say someone is purchasing heroin and they say, well, this is my subjective decision. And I think the heroin is going to be Yeah, that's the more point likely. that I was getting at. Well, I think the distinction is it will become clearer if we completely take out con- confidence from and confidence and transparency from this. So some things are just unethical, some things are just positively ethical, and some things there's not much ethically to say about it. So to, I mean, I, I think the audience will probably understand this better if we start giving some specific examples now. So, like for for example, um, I'm not sure whether elderberry extract would reduce the risk of COVID-19 if taken prophylactically because there are no randomized controlled trials yet, although I've been approached about participating in potentially two. Um, There are no randomized controlled trials testing whether elderberry extract reduces the risk of COVID-19. However, taking elderberry extract is unethical, whereas the ethics of transacting heroin is debatable And the ethics of scamming someone or murdering someone or stealing from someone is completely unethical. So when we're talking about taking elderberry extract, which basically has no ethics around it as as an action in and of itself, um, then I then I think that's the 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 un the ethics of uh, elderberry extract taking. And heroin transacting and stealing from someone are independent ethical concerns that are not related to transparency or confidence. Well, I think I think we all understand that they're different, and I am, I think we understand that there's they're different uh, ethically. But the the issue is we're trying to come up with principles on what makes them different. So, for example, let's say someone um, let's say someone recommends that. Okay, so for COVID-19, I'm as a private individual, I'm going to recommend to whoever has this subjective valuation for um, taking heroin that there may be in my value in someone says hypothetically in my valuation judgment that, you know, the um, first whatever subset of people who really enjoy heroin can get them through this, yada, yada, yada. Um, it may be beneficial or may be worth their while. Um, and they say, well, I'm just a private individual. I'm going to, I'm not a, a scientific organization. And it's also their subjective valuation. Um, and then someone says the same thing about elderberry, elderberry extract. So the question is, now I agree that there is a difference there. Um, but the question is not that if there is a difference there. I think the question here is what's, what are the principles underlying the difference? So it can't I be think, just, yeah, yeah, I think this is a, I think this is really straightforward to answer. Elderberry uh-huh. extract's not addictive. Elderberry extract uh, does does not, you know, put people out of work. Elderberry extract doesn't ruin families. Sure. Elderberry extract doesn't have there there's no quanti- there's there's no like body of literature quantifying okay, yeah, yeah, the negative absolutely. public health burden of her- of elderberry extract. Yeah, yeah, I, and I and I agree with that. But notice how none of those symmetry breakers were the earlier invoked symmetry breakers. Notice how those symmetry breakers are not well, it's, you know, private individual or it's um it's a new judgment. It can't be symmetry breakers for these cases because they apply to both cases. So the symmetry breakers I hear you bringing up is that, okay, then not to say they're not reason, unreasonable, they're not reasonable, they are reasonable. It's just that, um, well, let's get them on the table. So the ri- I hear risks, I hear harms, so that's fine. There's a low confidence that this is harmful for people. There's low confidence. That, I mean, there's a, our point estimate for harm is very low. Uh, the risks are lower, so that's one symmetry breaker. Um, and then the other symmetry breakers, um, well, I think they all, everything mentioned here is, is um, subsumed under that. 
and Isaac saying they could all be grouped under um, utility. Yeah, exactly. Um, so then the question becomes like, okay, so let's say it's not heroin. Let's say it's just, you know, let's say it's, well, let's say it's anything. Like people could, private individuals could, there are a lot of things that don't have, that have very harms. Uh, we like, can, like homeopathic remedies and things yeah, like that. Yeah, yeah. Um, and I think most people are going crazy over people who are, you know, well, not, I don't know if how many people are going crazy, but, well, let's just ask. Uh, do you think, what do you think about people recommending homeopathic remedies for uh, COVID-19? You're asking me? I'm asking both of you. Oh, well, I mean, I think the three of us sort of share the bias that a homeopathic remedy isn't going to work. Um, however, I would also point out that homeopathic is a marketing term that is applied to things that are not homeopathic in principle. So there are homeopathic things that work if what you mean by homeopathic is that it's labeled as homeopathic. So actually homeopathy like essentially doesn't mean anything. Sure, we'd have to get more specific on what the homey up. There are there, you can go down to Rite Aid or Dwayne Reed or Walgreens, and you can buy zinc lozenges that are homeopathic, but they're not homeopathic by any any standard by which homeopathic is criticized by anyone, or by any standard upon which um, anyone who advocates homeopathy describes homeopathy. Like they just contain zinc, and they have the same amount of zinc as any other zinc lozenge. They're going to act like a zinc lozenge but they're marketed as homeopathic because they're being sold no, to I people who buy homeopathic sure. things. I mean, this is, this is, this is kind of, okay. This is kind of silly. We could just narrow it down to a definition of homeopathic that, um, that's relevant here. So like a definition of homeopathic would be, um, what is it like something that's diluted to the point it's like diluted 10 times or something like that. I'm not quite, uh, yeah, we can, we can get any specific definition. example. So someone takes, uh, um, and it's not, uh, one million or something in water and start selling that for COVID-19. Okay, fine. I think all of us would agree that um, from a utilitarian perspective, there's probably no utility in that homeopathic remedy. I think whether the whether that's an ethical thing, I, I mean, I personally, in my personal view of ethics, that to me would come down a lot to like the intentions of the person behind it. Like it's hard for me to criticize someone who believes homeoth homeopathy works and sells homeopathy to see their ethics as anywhere near equivalent to someone who knows that homeopathy is BS and uh, sells it anyway because they know people will buy it. So, I mean, to me, like I'd have to understand more of the situation to to say what the ethics around it are. But I think the three of us would agree that. Uh, something by that homeopathic definition would have no utility and it would be an overall a negative thing for people to be uh, using it to prevent COVID-19. There's one thing I want to clarify. There's a distinction in the ethics that I want to clarify here. And there's, because there's two different ways you can look at this and they're both relevant. So there's the, the intention of the person and there's the act itself and the utility it causes. Um, there's really another thing involved in ethics, but just sticking to this for now, I think there's an important distinction between whether we can, whether we're ethically judging a person or whether we're ethically judging an action. So an action, I think we can judge if an action produces an enormous amount of net negative utility, all else being equal. Even if the intentions are good, we may not judge the person, but we can judge the action. We can say that this was a bad action. Um, even if but by that criteria, then I think the three of us would agree that that's a bad action. Okay, sure. So we, we could say that we would say, okay, the action is bad. Um, the person, we can't really say that the person really he was doing the correct thing. Do we agree with that? I do. Yeah, that sounds fine. Okay. Okay. Um, wait, Isaac, what do you mean neutral utility but bad? No, we're talking about a case where something produces a lot of net utility drain like a in a hypothetical we're talking about um uh well well that was just an example so let's go back to the um let's go back to the um homeopathy and by homeopathy we just mean something like that will produce like clearly n no benefit and utility like the something that's diluted down to one in a thousand or something 
uh, or the one in a billion. And then we'll ask, okay, so how are we, so two questions, how are we judging the person and how are we judging the action? So the person you could say, well, the person is, has good intentions. They're not trying, they really believe in what they're doing. Uh, and then what are we doing with the action? Um, and now if the action, I, I would, the a, there's always something, um, and this is with all decision making that I think a lot of people don't really consider. Um, there's always, there, there's usually in a lot of these sales, there's always a, well, there's a couple things. There's a, always this initial utility drain. And the initial utility drain comes from several factors. One factor it comes from is the cost, the resource cost of the item. So it's not just that you're getting this diluted thing for free, even if it would be neutral, you're not, you actually have to spend money for it. And then it's not like you're having this one in a billion thing uh, appear in front of you if you pay for it. You actually have to go to the store and take time out of your day and take energy. You have to exert effort in order to get it. Um, and then you have to spend time to do it. It's not like you can do that amount, exert that energy in you know, zero second time out of your day to do it. So all of these things are opportunity costs. It's an opportunity cost in respect to resources used. It's an opportunity cost in respect to energy exerted. It's an opportunity cost in respect to time. Um, and all of these things have to be, in order for it to be, just in order for it to be neutral for you, it has to, that risk benefit analysis has to make up for that initial investment in money, time, energy, et cetera. I think that's yeah. true, but I think that that is, uh, I think that's a completely individual decision that is that is based on how that person values their own money. Sure. Well, yeah. I mean, from a, from a recommendation standpoint, I mean, you could just answer the question or 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 speculate. Okay, would somebody be better off if they stayed at home during a pandemic like this, or would it would they be better off if they left their home, went to a public place, and spent twenty dollars on elderberry? Are they in a net? better place having purchased the elderberry or are they in a net negative place having gone well, out this and i mean this stuff? is i live in new york city this is a borderline extremely irrelevant thing to discuss like there almost nothing is open i can go to the grocery store i go to the grocery store when i need to i'm wearing gloves and there's giant plexiglass screens between the cashier and the and and the person paying and there's a sign saying please try not to talk so you don't spread the disease and you can order elderberry online. So like from a social distancing and hygiene perspective, generally people are trying to order things online. Um, and probably you got your elderberry like a month ago if you wanted to. Okay, I just want to clarify one thing. So when we agreed, I'm not sure how much, like I think there is still a distinction. So when we, when we talk about these factors, the initial utility drain being an individual decision, um, it is okay. So yes and no. So it is an individual decision in terms of everything. Um, you because different people decide how much of a drain that is for them. Um, but I do think there is an actual. But if if we look at certain metrics, I do think we can actually come up with certain answers. So for example, so this is not going to be a symmetry breaker with, you know, it's that wouldn't even be a symmetry breaker with the heroin. If someone really values the heroin enough, you could make that individual decision that no matter, even if it does destroy his family, like he, he is going to make the individual subjective decision to value it so greatly that it will be better for him. So it all depends on what standard we're measuring it against. If we're talking about health, we, there isn't an, an actual answer we can say, even if we can t say the rights are, yeah, it is his right, how much he wants to value something. But if we're trying to answer a question, whether this is going to produce utility, if we, what we need to be clear on what we're we may need to clarify what we're defining as utility, but there should be an answer, even if we're not clear of it, there should be some answer about whether I, that's happening. I think all I think all three of us are in complete agreement that heroin is a net negative. Okay, yes, but the thing but yes, we do agree on that, but the issue is why we agree on that. So if if the reason we agree on that is because of we're looking at things like health, sure. Um, mm -hmm. but then we're gonna come back to this discussion about the initial resource and everything and if how that's going to impact health and it's not going to be nearly as much of a magnitude as heroin but you can make the case like okay well instead of spending twenty dollars on elderberry if someone spent twenty dollars on even assuming we didn't have a mask shortage like on a mask or like on the hand sanitizer or on something or whatever else that they could spend their money on through an opportunity cost or even just staying at home and not in, in 
you know, not infecting others. Um, they may value the elderberry extract to such a degree that they may want to go out and have the risk of infecting others and purchase it. But if we're, if we're just standardizing to health, yes, I will agree with you on the heroin, but then I may not agree with you on the elderberry if the risks um, balance out the benefit. We would have to have that conversation about, okay, well, there's the risk of, there's the risk of going out, contra- getting the disease from someone else. There's the risk of going out, giving the disease to someone else. There's the risk of, I'm, I'm not sure any, but I'm not sure any of us would actually disagree on that because I I probably wouldn't go out to buy elderberry extract under these conditions. Okay, well, but then put that in, you know, like put put that. I I mean, did you put that in your? Well, I, I also I also have to consider the fact that I live in New York City, and so the risk of going out is dramatically different than for the the risk of um for now. Of, uh, Going out somewhere, yeah. For well, yeah. For now, um, <laughs> yeah. I I don't know. I'll I'll have to I'll have to reread how I made the guide, and uh, I mean because at the at the bottom of every single page of my guide, as well as a paragraph on the first page and a paragraph on the sales page, it says that nothing in the guide is to pers- is to supersede the social distancing and hygiene recommendations um, uh, of the public health authorities, and then there's also a link to what I'm doing myself on the first page that goes to a, a blog post that I wrote about what I'm doing. And uh, I, I do there describe the rationale that as far as I'm concerned, the number one priority is to minimize exposure to the virus. The number two priority is to minimize the chance that if you are exposed to the virus, it gets into your nose or mouth and there from there gets into your lungs. The number three concern is if there's something we can do to prevent docking of the cell, of uh, uh, to prevent the entry of the virus into the cell, such as docking or fusion to the cell membrane, that's the next priority. Preventing replication, if there's something we can do about that, would be the next priority. And supporting the immune system, or generally providing it doesn't cause any harm to any of the other issues, would be the next most important thing. So uh, I. I, I'm I, now that you bring it up, I'm sure I could probably clarify how to put that into action with practical examples. But um, I agree, I could probably improve the the guide by by giving more practical examples of how to weigh uh, the decision to buy something in person with the particular disease risk in your area. Yeah, yeah. Because yeah. the thing is, um, the thing is, even if we. Uh even if we follow the social distancing guidelines, um, you'd agree that the very act of going out to the grocery store carries some non-zero risk of either contracting or spreading the, con- the disease. Um, and it's well, I, I agree with that. Um, although I don't think, I mean, I, at this point, I think we're kind of beyond the point where even if we stayed inside, we could one hundred percent prevent it right. because but there's, there's a an relatively increase. significant chance that it's on surfaces in your own apartment. Yeah, for sure. But you would you would agree that the chance, whatever chance that is in, in staying in your house, will probably be an increased risk if you go to some you know vitamin shop or store where undoubtedly everyone else is already going, because there's a whole bunch of other people going to get these things. I agree with that, and and of course this is a, a situation that's evolving. I mean, the, the guide when I the guide came out, um, it's at least a week, if not. A week and a half, and it was you know being written in the days before that, and this the situation of the degree of social distancing that one should rationally apply has gotten more severe uh, by the day over that time period, and so you know I look at that a little bit different now than when I had written it, and that's probably why when I update it in the next couple of days, um, and especially after this conversation, I, I will try to include more guidance on that. Okay, cool. Yeah. So there's, but the point that's the the general principle and point is to always weigh the initial, um, even when it comes to money. Like someone can have a different valuation on money, um, and that's fine. That's a that's a question of a subjective valuation judgment. But there is an objective answer in terms of what is this person's health going to, even if we don't know what the answer is. What's this person's health going to be if they, instead of spending that money, spent the money on X, Y, Z instead? There's always like opportunity costs to these things. So it's not just, the point is just, it's not just a question of what our, 
what our speculation of our point estimate is and the vaguety surrounding that, it's we have to also subsume that within what are the initial costs of getting the product. Um, I I agree with that. I just think that first of all, I mean, th- there are things that are like very straightforward to quantify. So like the infection risk, um, whether you're infected or not, it's binary. You can model the risk of going outside in any given area in terms of the chance of getting infected. You can, you know, you you could sort of assume that um, getting COVID-19, I, I don't know how, how you would exactly quantify that. I think that would be very difficult to quantify, but I think like it would be reasonable to have like a preliminary model where you just said that that, was, that would be something you would avoid at, at like, I don't know, attach some huge cost to it or something um, arbitrarily or just consider it something you don't want to risk at all or something like that. Um, but I think, you know, when you're getting into something like what is the opportunity cost of the $15 that you spent on a bottle of elderberry, I think that is impossible to assess on an objective manner, especially with respect to someone's health. And I think that, um, the only way you could come up with a number would be to make a, a lot, very large number of, um, of assumptions that are probably false, so, for example, you could assume that that person would have spent that fifteen dollars on the thing that would have been the best decision toward their health, but that's exceedingly unlikely. And um, and then, of course, who who on earth could possibly know what fifteen dollar expenditure would be the the best thing for that person's health in that instant? There's too many contextual factors for that person to know that, or for anyone else to know that. So, I mean, I agree with you that in the with the, I agree, I agree in theoretical principle that you can quantify that. I just think practically that you can't quantify it in a meaningful way. Yeah, I think it becomes easier. I think it I think that this is becoming more and more it becomes more and more vague to quantify when the dollar amount goes lower and lower. I think I think you would have a different opinion if the dollar amount if we could just scale up the dollar amount and Oh, if they didn't, let's say it was in fifteen dollars. Let's say it was fifteen thousand dollars for an elderberry supplement. I think you can say all the same things you just said. You can say, well, you know, if instead of fifteen thousand dollars, would they really have spent fifteen thousand dollars on something better for their health? Maybe they would have spent fifteen thousand dollars on something worse for their health. But I think it becomes clearer as we take this supplement, where we may have this like t- very small point estimate or that's vague and we don't really know where it is and. If we scale up the dollar amount, you, at some point you would say, okay, this is probably going to, if we recommend people get elderberry, it's probably going to cause more harm than good if we scale up the dollar amount. Would you agree with that? Yeah, I mean, I would, I would say that's very overpriced elderberry. And then I would say that you've now moved into the typical experience of someone in the United States medical system who gets procedures done and unexpected bills for $6,000 and no result. Yeah, especially if the procedure has, you know, very, you know, has the, like, if, for example, if the procedure behind it had the evidence of elderberry behind it, like, would you say that's a net harm? I, I didn't understand that question. Can you repeat it? So, let, yeah, yeah. So, let's say whatever um, evidence behind the procedure being done to benefit is the risk benefit ratio had was equalized to elderberry for the COVID and it costed $15,000. Would you say that is a net harm? Like a, to recommend this? I, for a I, I, so I, I, I've, I'm finding it very hard to think about how to practically apply that because, um, so for example, like right now when I said that, I was thinking about how I had an MRI earlier this year for reasons that were pretty reasonable if I were to be ruling out the, um, the like, sort of like maximal downside risk of, of, what there might have been some relatively unclear signs of wound up three thousand uh, dollars with a three thousand dollar bill and it didn't find anything. So in retrospect, it feels like I wasted that money. But you could argue that you're you're preventing some extremely unlikely, but very you know extremely unlikely thing with a very high downside risk. So it's it's very hard for me to make a direct comparison to elderberry extract. I think it's it's more likely the case that elderberry extract either is or isn't effective in preventing COVID-19. And if it is effective, I would 
just pull pull a wild guess that it would be roughly effective on the order of reducing the viral load by 50%, maybe reducing incidents by 50%, and maybe reducing time spent sick by 50% on the basis that that's basically what it's done in uh, three trials that have looked at the flu and the common cold, and on the basis that most herbal antivirals, when they are effective against a given virus, tend to have roughly that effect size. Um, and so I think it's like it's like wildly different to say, should you take this low priced thing on the possibility that it could have a 50% effect size given what we know? Um, and it's possible that it would be waste given that we haven't tried it yet. I don't know how to begin comparing that one to one with the three thousand dollars I spent on the MRI that gave me no results. Well, Chris, like you're giving all these specific examples, sure. Um, so you're giving different, like, okay, there's and there's all sort of atomized points you can make for all of these things. That's sure, sure. But notice how you are. I think you are factoring in the cost of this. I can keep scaling it up. I don't have to stop at fifteen thousand. The point. It's just yeah. Of, of, of course, of course, I agree with the principle yeah, of yeah, opportunity yeah. Okay. cost with the money. That's just very okay, cool. That's e- econ one hundred and one. Right. Okay. So we don't. We're not going to disagree on that. It's just that it's hard to quant. It's hard to say how much that one way. Sure. That's a. I com- I completely agree with that. It's very hard to quantify uh, the subjective valuation of a low price dollar amount, and of course that's relative to someone's disposable income as well. Like the the fifteen thousand dollars is chump change yeah. to some people, and for those people. If they want to spend fifteen thousand dollars on an elderberry extract, like if that if their disposable income is such that they have a thousand times more of it than the average person, then I probably am not going to judge their call at all. But obviously, the, if the dollar price is large relative to the person's disposable income, there start to become there start to we start to introduce negative effects that have negative utility that are so obvious to everyone and there would be such consensus about them that there it would be hard to disagree with them. So for example, it's it's um I think it's reasonable to say that regardless of what that person thinks, they are in a very bad situation if they go into debt, they can't pay their mortgage. Right? But it's it's um so it's the reason I agree with you that the lower the dollar price amount, the harder it is to put an objective valuation on it. Um but but that's that's basically because um, if it's if it's a if it's a small portion of a person's disposable income, then there's no, nothing objective you can say about the opportunity cost. Whereas if the opportunity cost comes down to things that are known to be essential to basic health and life and function in society, then we start to get into an area where we can we can make an objective statement about that opportunity cost. Okay, sure. So then the. The issue is the same. Would you say the same thing um, applies about um, the the difficulty it is to make a uh, just like it's hard to it's hard to really weigh out where this thing lies when there's a low dollar amount. I would also say it's hard to weigh out this thing very uncertainty and there's a very large vaguity in the effect size and the effect size is probably going to be low and if we know that at all and if all those other things. So like if, if we shrink the signal of benefit also to the same degree that we're shrinking the cost. Wait a um, second. Uh, what, why would we agree that the effect size is going to be low? Oh, I, I, I'm talking about the, um, sorry. I mean the confidence we have in the effect size. Okay. Yeah. So, um, and, but this has, this, like it, we can also talk about the effect size being low too. It doesn't have to be elderberry. Um, it could be all sorts of supplements. Like I'm just talking about, like we could talk about individual. I want to just start on principles. Um, we'll start on base principles and then we can go to like each individual supplement. We'll go to elderberry, we can go sure. to copper, we can go to, yeah. So you would agree that as we shrink the effect size, just like we're shrinking the dollar amount, we could say the same thing by shrinking the effect size. Right. Uh, are you? Are you? Did you mean to say effect size or confidence? Um, really both. Uh, if we're like talking about like a lower, just so the dollar. I'm. I'm the analogy I'm trying to make here as well. Where we shrink the dollar amount, we could also shrink the effect size of benefit, and say as we as we shrink the dollar amount. Okay, we agree that it, it's harder to determine whether something's 
what how much of a role that plays in the initial harm well, and then we're, but we're, if we shrink we're, down the benefit remember we the the sort of like the reason if if i understand correctly the reason that we decided to have this debate was because we were debating cases where we had largely but not exclusively mechanistic evidence to make inferences about things that might work that haven't been directly tested and so um I think I think it's a different situation where you can where you can quantify like a point estimate of effect size with confidence. Um, but in any case, I mean, in terms of the principle, because I think may, maybe the I think the principles are different there. But I, you, I think you're better about sort of delineating what the principles are than I am. Yeah. yeah. But, so okay. Yeah. Sure. No. It's it's it's. I don't think this, we're going to disagree on this. It's just okay. So let let's say you have a certain amount of money. Um, and you're you have this initial harm of spending whatever money amount. It's easy to recognize that that's for most people uh, giving away your money has a certain downside. Um, everyone agrees with that, um, but usually people are doing it because they think it's going to be worth it. Now, if we shrink down the amount of money people are giving away, sure, we we are less concerned about that initial harm. Um, I'm all I'm saying is whatever the product that they're purchasing, if we shrink down the amount our of the effect we could make the same this we could also say the same thing we're shrinking our concern that that's going to be beneficial that's all that's literally all i'm saying I don't okay think and, wh and what are you that. what are you saying is the result of that you're saying it has the same effect as raising the dollar i'm saying well it could at some point it, i don't know exactly where that will be but if we if just all, to the same degree that I'm not, that we I'm can not, say I'm not sure I, I'm not sure I agree yeah, with sure. that at all. I, oh, and I, I just want to make sure you understand what I'm saying. Um, if we, all I'm saying is that, look, there's a certain amount of harm that someone is going to do to themselves by giving X amount of their money away, right? Um, there's a certain amount of that they're going to be able to do less things. They're going to be able to spend less things and other things. There's a certain amount of there's a certain negative thing that someone is it's like it's a, any investment i'd rather just call it an opportunity cost sure opportunity cost so that opportunity cost is going to be less when the right everyone i don't see how anyone could disagree with this right everything has an opportunity cost yes but the opportunity cost is less when the investment the dollar amount is less correct okay so, and then we can also say that not all investments have equal returns uh, some investments we agree. Uh, yeah. So all I'm saying here is that with the benefit, there could be things that are likely to have a huge benefit. There could be things that are likely we think are likely to have a medium benefit. And there are things that are likely to have little to no benefit. Agreed. Yeah. And just like we're weighing, just like we may be less concerned about the opportunity cost, we may be less concerned about the benefit if it's, less if we think it'll be less that's all i'm saying agreed okay so we don't we're not disagreeing on anything okay cool no yeah all right um, okay, so we so my point here is that we just have to factor all um, we have to try to factor all those things in and if we are if we have a low if we have a low confidence and a low effect size for the benefits and we also have a low confidence and low effect size for the opportunity costs then Maybe it's a, it's just a wash. Now you can say, well, maybe there's a there's a higher degree of confidence or a higher point estimate re, uh, of magnitude for the individual supplements, and then we can get into specifics. But on principle, I don't think we're disagreeing with anything. I don't think we're disagreeing on these principles. Okay. Is there anything you want to add, Nick? I feel like I've been talking a lot. <laughs> like if you disagree, oh, no, if there's anything like uh, like Chris said, you're a lot better than. Than at this than me and i honestly didn't get a lot of sleep last night i'm i'm more or less just listening because i'm the least qualified person in the room to be honest okay cool um so so we we're not disagreeing on anything we agree that there's a point estimate there's a confidence interval we agree that there's like some certainty we have there's um and then there's uh, some opportunity costs for all of these things and the opportunity costs include um, the money spent, the time spent, the energy spent, and the risk, in this particular case, the risk of contracting or spreading the infection by actually going to purchase the item. 
for many people who are purchasing it on an a- in an actual physical store. I, I agree in principle. Um, I think when we get into specifics, I'll probably disagree on how relevant a lot of those concerns are, but I agree with all the principles. I don't think you'll disagree on me on the last one. I, I, surely everyone agrees. Uh, no, I, surely I, well, I think the, the, th- the thing is that the we c- if we're doing an analysis on what we think uh, someone else will do, we have to factor in what the actual thing they would have done instead is. No, and I'm so, not talking about that, Chris. I'm, I'm talking about the last one. The last one I said is the opportunity. The opportunity cost, well, this isn't even an opportunity cost. It's actually just a risk. Um, the risk of actually going to the store and purchasing. No, I no, I, well, I think what I'm saying applies equally to that. So, so oh, okay. yes, if, so if, if someone goes out to the store to buy elderberry extract when they would not have gone out to the store, then yes, they've introduced a risk that has to be factored in there. But if the actual, so like that, but that's a theoretical, the opportunity cost would have been, you know, you couldn't, you could have spent that time staying indoors where the risk of infection was lower. But uh, in many, if not most cases, that person might be going out anyway to buy other things when they buy the elderberry extract, in which case the opportunity cost, uh, or in which case the alternative course of action would have been to go out and for the same infection risk and not buy that. So without, um, so when we get into specifics, it, what I'm saying is that we can't just use the theoretical opportunity cost that we believe would have been the best course of action or the one that would have the most impact on the calculation. We have to reasonably think about what those people probably would have been doing instead. Sure. That, I, I agree with that. There are ways of mitigating that opportunity cost if you're going to go out shopping anyway. And that supplement is there in the grocery store and you don't actually have to go to a vitamin shop or some kind of other shop to go out of your way and get it. Fine. Then the, um, I think, in, I think, although I suspect in reality, a good portion of those people are not just going to go to the grocery store to get it. They may fun, go to the grocery store, oh, hey, wait a minute, it's not here. Let me go to the vitamin shop or something um, along those lines. But okay, we should get they into... Could be, or they could become aware of it between grocery shopping trips and make a special trip just to get that. Yeah, there's a lot of, a lot of these factors that... Would, um, you could always also make the argument, well, in, this person's going to make a, gro- uh, a vitamin shop trip instead of going to a beach party, and then their risk will be even lower. But I don't, again, this will be speculative, but I, I suspect the speculation, especially with all the beach parties being shut down and everything. Um, I, I, I think, um, I, I think obviously this will be very different for different people, but I mean, t- to be honest, I think most of the people reading recommendations about what supplements to use are buying supplements no matter what, and they're using it to make choices of what supplements to buy, not to buy the supplements or not. I think that's, I think that's going to be the majority case. Okay. Um, okay. So then we're going, so I think we, we agreed on principles. We may just disagree on how these different principles factor in into the different case, specific cases. The other thing I'll just mention is the, the the way we get to point estimates and how and how confident we are of them. So, in nutrition, nutrition is a well. I'm sure everyone knows the field of nutrition. Um, so at some point, we have to hang our hats on something, um, on some gold standard, and I think we all agree on that. I think we all agree that you know the gold standard is RCTs, but we don't always think RCTs are you know always necessary for all things um, to make a decision. So I think we both agree on that. Um, you, sometimes you, if there's no RCT data, um, you can look at other forms of data to try to make inferences. I don't think anyone disagrees on that. Um, no, I don't disagree yeah. with that. Okay, so, and then the question becomes, well, how do we gauge our confidence when we're using, of course, the RCT, we can make the same question about the RCT when we're gauging confidence, because RCTs aren't reality themselves, they're just ways of, they're just the best tool we have at the moment, short of meta-analyses of well-conducted RCTs with valid inclusion, exclusion criteria, etc. So, what we can do is we can look at concordance. Well, concordance might not be the best thing because there's different definitions of concordance, but we can take a certain type of evidence lower on the evidence hierarchy, and we can look at how much 
of a binary success it has. And by binary success, I mean it just points in the same point estimate direction of the RCTs itself. And this actually has been done in nutrition for prospective cohort studies. What they do is they could, and it's been done dishonestly and honestly. So have you, ever, have you guys ever seen that, um, that thing where they said, oh, like none of the prospective cohort studies in nutrition ever panned out? to rcts are you talking about yoannidis paper uh 80 what my, why most published research findings yeah so well, i don't know if, I, if that's the one i'm talking about i don't remember the name i just remember like zero of the claims uh were in the same uh were in the same were the same as rct it's the one where I, re- they- I recall that but i don't remember which paper that was and something in me thinks that yoannidis had something Okay, I I, we, I can look it up after this, but um, I actually I actually had that posted at me, um, and they compared prospective cohort studies to RCTs in nutrition science, and they claimed that none of the zero the 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 per, the chance of none of the claims actually panned out to RCTs, and immediately that struck me as like that's incredibly that must have been completely cherry picked, and the reason for that is because. If that were true, it would mean prospective cohort studies are probably the best thing you could do um, in terms of proxying our studies. You would just prospective co- make a recommendation in the opposite of point estimate effects point uh, estimate direction as the prospective cohort study concluded. If it's really I, true, I actually think prospective cohort studies are are one of the worst forms of evidence, excluding like other like case control studies and stuff like that. Um, be, but it, I think it's highly dependent on the context. So for example, like I put zero stock in any body of prospective cohort studies, no matter how large, if the thing being studied is something that the public health authorities have been telling people to do for 50 years. Like that just strikes me as hopelessly confounded by um, healthy user bias and you know the 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 fact that there's a a cl- almost certainly a cluster of behaviors that are clustering with following public health recommendations. Okay, but see, the thing with that, Chris, is that's all going to be subsumed within these. Within, a, if you run a concordance analysis, whatever, whatever speculations or whatever biases you can you can throw at the prospective cohort studies that's already going to be factored in inherently in a concordance analysis. Because at the end of the day, they're either going to agree with RCTs or they're going to disagree with RCTs. I'm not so, sure I followed. You're, yeah, you're yeah. saying a concordance analysis between RCTs and prospective cohort studies? Is that the Yeah, sure. So if, you, yeah, so if you were to just have a, like a, if you were to do an analysis and say, okay, look, I'm going to take RCTs for different nutrition questions, and I'm going to take the prospective cohort studies and different nutrition questions. I'm going to have like a rigorous criteria by how I'm picking these RCTs, but from whatever search criteria, and I'm going to have a rigorous um, formulaic way of picking the just as well the prospective cohort studies. I'm going to see the the uh, effect size and the direction of effect size in the cohort studies. I'm going to the effect size. I'm just how much they agree with you. They're independently done. I just want to see how much they yeah, do with each other. I, I follow this, but what are you? What were you saying about what yeah. I said being built into the, pers- the, yeah. the concordance analysis? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So whatever, if you want to say, so there are different arguments for why you know prospective cohort studies may be um, valid or invalid or have high confidence or low confidence. And all I'm saying is, all of those things are subsumed are going to be subsumed within the agreement of with RCTs. You can bring all sorts of speculations for or against. Uh, you could want so you can say healthy user bias. You can say, oh, but it's a large sample size. You're you say saying the RCTs would control for the healthy user bias. Is that what you so, are? No, no. I'm saying that the concordance, whether it concords with RCTs or not, is already the question is whether how much. Because look, we always have to hang our hat on something. I think we're all hanging our hat on our. So then the question is just, well, if we hang our hat on our RCTs, if we look at prospective HP with the RCTs. In other words, so how likely are we to get the same direction of effect size with RCTs if we look at prospective cohorts? Yeah, are you say, are you saying that the are you saying that if they are concordant, then that uh, then that means that the prospective cohort studies were not being confounded by one of those concerns, whereas if no. they were, there would not be concordant. No, not necessarily. 
it all just I'm increases saying, our confidence that there isn't confound or there that the effect that we're seeing is representing reality and not just confounding. Yeah. Despite yeah. In other words, look. I'm if, sorry. If I'm sorry. I was too a, binary in what I stated. So let me say that again. Are you saying that the concordance analysis increases the confidence that healthy user bias is not accounting for the effect in the perspective cohort? No, I'm sure there is. No, not necessarily. I'm sure not, then I don't, be, know, I don't understand what yeah, you're saying. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So what I'm saying is, in spite of all these, look, you're trying to proxy reality, and there's all sorts of arguments for and against why prospective cohort studies are, pro are being uh, an approximation toward reality. And it's just, all of these things are subsumed together. So, for example, you can introduce biases a way that will, you know, that will bias the, con the prospective cohort studies away from the null. There are certain biases towards the null. They all get subsumed together. And at the end of the day, you just want to know how likely it is to approximate reality. And the answer is, well, just if you assume RCTs are proxying reality, because you eventually have to assume something, then a concordance analysis is very useful. You could just, because it, look. So I think you are saying what I was, at, maybe I'm just, the way I'm wording it is confusing you, or or maybe it's confusing you that I'm bringing up a specific example and you're trying to get at a principle. But you're saying that the concordance increases the confidence that any particular of the possible biases toward or against the null are, um, Okay, let me rephrase it. That the concordance between the the two types of evidence increases the confidence that either one of them is a, or that the prospective cohort studies are are an approximate model of reality. Yes. So the difference is pro toto versus okay. pro. -toto. So I I what I what I had said before that led to this tangent. I was bringing that up only in the context of where there was discordance. I was just saying that. If I saw a discordance between, if I saw prospective cohort studies and RCTs coming to the opposite conclusion, um, my instinct would be to believe the RCTs. That's oh, I, yeah, I agree with that. Yeah, that's fine. So uh, the, all I'm saying is there's there's a lot of pro toto things that go away that go toward different directions for away the null and against the null, uh, toward the null or against the null. And then there's the pro tanto. That's the uh, uh, sorry. There's the pro toto, um, which is the total the, the, the overall when you assume all of these things are you overall when you lump in all the nutrition prospective cohort studies and you lump in all the nutrition rcts what how often do they agree with each other how often are they approximating each other um and we have data for that uh for nutrition um it's about it's about uh, when we're, when it's not cherry picked because the first example I got back to earlier when they said none of them actually did. Everyone rec hopefully everyone would recognize that if none of the prospective cohort studies um, had this point estimate in the same direction of the effect size. So when you set it up binary like that, so you can you can set a binary analysis where you say, okay, here's an effect size. So you, does the effect size point? Uh, to one direction away from the null, or does it point to the opposite direction? Helpful versus harmful. You can have all sorts of binary ways like that. And where does the point estimate land? Does the point estimate land um, toward the helpful direction or toward the harmful direction? And then question for our, our prospective cohort studies. Now, if all cases, if all cases of prospective cohort studies really had the point estimate, in opposite directions of the RCTs, like that paper was going around, it would actually make prospective cohort studies incredible. One of the most useful things you could do because you would just run the prospective cohort study and just do the opposite of what the prospective cohort study finds, and then you would get <laughs> yeah, and then you would just get what the RCT would have found. Like everyone's following that, right? That would be amazing. Yeah, yeah. So that's how I knew it was cherry picked. It's like it's so obvious it's very thick because if that we, were true, we could just we could just ask Walter Willett what to do and do the opposite. Exactly. That's literally what we would do. We would ask Walter Willett what to do and do the based on based on a prospective cohort study and we would do the opposite and we would be 100% guaranteed to have the right answer what the RCT would say every time. Imagine the memes that would come out with the, with, with Walter Willett's face on it. Walter Willett says this. Yeah, then Walter Willett says this, then just play opposite day and you get always get the what, right what walter willett says to do what my friends do what i exactly so clearly that had to be cherry picked and it was when i when i looked into it so 
Um, if you guys ever see that being cited around, you could actually make that point. You can say, actually, if this were not cherry picked, if this were actually reality, then it would mean prospective cohort studies are like an amazing, amazing thing to do. Um, to just play opposite day and get the right answer all the time. So where does it actually lie out? So prospective cohort studies actually turn out to lie. It's about, they have the same um, direction of effect size about 67% of the time. Um, so it's about a two-third, one-third split. Um, for any engineers, there is an engineer I uh, ran into uh, who you dislike, Nick. His, uh, I think his name was Rob. Oh, yeah, um, that guy. <laughs> yeah. He, he ran this through Python, and um, I don't think I disagreed with him. It's just uh, the signal-to-noise ratio is, uh, it turns out to be, uh, I think it's like 30-something percent signal and the rest noise. Which is not, which again is not, uh, and it, it's not terrible. It's not terrible. It's not amazing either. It's enough to get you to the same direction of effect size as an RCT about two thirds of the time. That's what. That's where it stands within the field of nutrition in prospective cohort studies. That's where the current prospective cohort studies stand. The effect size truly are in agreement. The direction of effect is truly in agreement with RCTs about two thirds of the time. And now the so next I, question. I I think like that yeah, in theory in theory that could be useful to say like okay we do a prospective cohort study this has a two thirds probability of being true we should do an RCT on it and I I'm sort of like in, on board with that I just don't think that aggregating all the prospective cohort studies and doing their concordance with all the RCTs aggregated is really a reflection of the reality so like um, you know the the thing is like. All, all of the statistics is sort of assuming that we're we're separating signal from random noise, but like randomness is is generally most of the time just things the cause and effect relationships that we can't identify or we don't understand, and so it, more likely than not, you're not seeing a you know a two thirds likelihood of the prospective cohort study predicting the RCT surrounded by random error. You, you know, a deeper analysis would probably show you that prospective cohort studies on certain topics are generally um, reliable and on other topics are generally... Of course, say, like, of course. You could atomize it. Yeah, yeah. You could atomize it all. No, no but you and Discord and gets like really hairy in terms of what the definitions are. There are different definitions of concordance and discordance. Right now, all I'm talking about is like a binary analysis for agreement, uh, okay, same sure. direction of effect size. Yeah. Um, that's not, the, by the way, for anyone listening, that's not the actual definition of concordance and discordance. There are more technical definitions for that in the literature. But anyway, um, yes, of course, you can atomize it further and further and you can say, well, within certain fields of nutrition, it's even more likely than two thirds. And within other fields of nutrition, it's less likely, you know, it's, it's dietary recalls, maybe more likely than a fu initial food frequency questionnaire. You can go all hair with it. All I'm just saying is that there's a overall average that can be done for prospective cohort studies. And the same thing is true, by the way, for mechanistic studies. This the, You can take an average of all these mechanistic, and it's not, by the way, the data wasn't on all the prospective cohort studies. They had some criteria uh, to include or not. But anyway, you can do the same thing for mechanistic studies and, and compare that to RCTs. Of the mechanistic studies that we do, um, what's their probability of agreeing with the effect size as RCTs? And then you can see what, what happens with that. Um, what, yeah. what is that number? So unfortunately, within the field of nutrition, we don't have the answer for that. I haven't seen mechanistic studies in this type of analysis in our, uh, where that has been done. There is so if, if yeah, we ahead. so I, just to bring this back to the sort of original topic that we haven't gotten to yet, um, in, mm -hmm. in terms of COVID-19, the way yeah. that I was looking at the literature was to screen things in terms of number one, are there in vivo antiviral effects that have quantifiable effect sizes with other viruses? Number two, are there in vitro mechanisms that suggest that the effect would generalize to SARS-CoV-2, which causes COVID-19, uh, on the basis of what we know about them? So for example, um, SARS-CoV-2 has 87% proteomic uh, hom homology to SARS-CoV-1, or SARS-CoV actually called, and um, and there are 
three known viruses that get into cells using the using ACE2 on the cell surface, and that's SARS-CoV-2, SARS-CoV-1, and uh, another less known coronavirus, human coronavirus NL63. And so my reasoning was if if there's mechanistic evidence suggesting that we could generalize across antiviral properties, um, or that there's, or even if we couldn't generalize, if there's mechanistic evidence suggesting an effect on this virus, and there's also uh, RCTs suggesting a general in vivo antiviral activity in humans, then that, and I'm not, I'm not putting a number on it because like you said, we don't have this number, but I would consider that among the most likely to have a beneficial effect in reducing the risk of COVID-19 or reducing the number of sick days when used prophylactically. Whereas if something did not have an antiviral activity or its mechanism of antiviral activity suggested that it could either be useless or harmful in the context of this, then I think generalizing from like cold or flu, if the mechanistic evidence suggests that's a bad idea on that basis, um, that would be a poor selection. Um, and so I, I think you could quantify that if you had the data, it's just that I think making that data would, would require a team of researchers to devote an enormous amount of time to. And I don't think that's the best use of anyone's time right now. Uh, the best use of anyone's time right now, who's interested in this topic is to do an RCT on, uh, prevention in healthcare workers or on, um, or on mild, you know, recovery in mild cases. It's not to go back and analyze all the in vitro relevant in vitro research and try to come up with a model to predict the likelihood that something's going to have an effect. That would take the amount of time that it would take to do a short term RCT of of these things. Um, but no, I, you, I understand. I'm just it has been done with with in not in the nutrition field. It's been done in the pharmaceutical field, um, and it depends. It turns out it depends on how you're getting the in vitro data. Um, yeah, well, of, of, well, of course it does, but also no, I mean, how you're per- searching for it. If you're doing a database search versus whatnot, I'm not talking about like methods of the actual in vitro data. Um, when oh, you uh, aggregate it, yeah, I don't know. You- yeah, yeah, yeah. So there's differences. I'll send you the paper. There's differences between how the how the papers are were found. If you're and what they find is that if you're doing if you're doing it just by a database search. For mechanistic studies, again, this is just averaging everything. Some mechanistic studies may be more accurate than others. Just like some, when you're doing a database search for it, it really just does fall, the the success of translation really does fall on the 50-50. It really is just... What's what's the alternative to the database search? Uh, Let me check, actually. That's a good question. Um, There were were two alternatives. Um, There were, hold on, let me see. I'll post the paper in general as well. Um, and just keep in mind, this is not the field of nutrition. This is, ph- this is the pharmacy field with animal research. So animal concordance translation. Well, let me, I mean, let me just say like a, 50, 50, a 50% chance of translation is higher than I would expect for any of the things that I recommended. And I think that's like phenomenal in terms of if you could combine four or five components of a protocol that you thought had 50% chance of translation um, with, well, wait, you know, say, a 50% it's just, effect. It's not just 50% chance of 50 harm. Sorry, you were breaking up. It's not, yeah, yeah, it's not, it's not just, it's not necessarily, I don't think it's necessarily 50% chance of success and the other 50 is neutral. I think the other 50 could very well be harm. Oh yeah, well, of course, that's also pharmaceuticals, and so you yeah, have to yeah. keep in in mind whether something has thousands of use, thousands of years of safe use behind it. RCTs already using it for three months that shown a good safety profile. Um, you know, I, I think like the the um, the FDA's uh, generally recognized as safe concept. I think pretty much applies to anything that's been in like routine use for thousands of years and is not going to have the risk profile of a pharmaceutical drug. So I had, I I did post the study in uh, general chat. It's uh, it uh, varied based on search strategies. So if it was a success rate between studies retrieved by our network reference lists and database searches, database searches had the lowest point estimate, right? Basically right at the 50, 50, maybe a slightly higher actually. 
But anyway, this is, hasn't been done in nutrition, and these numbers could be all different. So anyway, the point, I think we're agreeing on principles. I just wanted to introduce this to say that there actually are ways we can, just to say there are ways we can really just get an average of prospective cohort studies and where they tier out on average in, compar- in the evidence hierarchy and do the same thing for mechanistic studies and do the same thing for cross-sectional studies and whatnot. So there are ways we can objectively answer this question for what really should be in the order of the evidence hierarchy. Once we just hang our hats on one thing, we can just look at, once we agree to a gold standard, we can look at the concordance for everything else below that. And we would have to just follow that. Um, we, we, and all of our speculation at that point, um, actual anatomized, but if we're answering the overall general question, we wouldn't be able to say, oh, healthy user bias, this, this, that. No, like on average, it really is true that prospective cohort studies lie here and mechanistic studies lie here. And all of our speculation doesn't really matter if we're answering the average question. Um, that's all. That's the only point I was trying to make. I kind, I kind of agree with that, but I don't, I don't think that, um, I don't think that should trump actual dis- like detailed discussion of the issues because no, of course, yeah, not. Like, of course, if you don't discuss the issues, then you revert to the quantified probability based on classify, you know, classifying all perspective. Of course uh, not, Chris. I, I'm not disagreeing with you. Yeah, I'm not, I, of course, you have to discuss, like, you, I'm not saying, like, this is a law, like, certain prospect, I'm, I'm sure that certain prospect cohort studies would be so badly conducted that... Oh, wait a second. Are, yeah. are, you, are, are you saying that um, you, you can't say as a class of studies prospective cohort studies are affected by healthy user bias and therefore we can dismiss them because as a class they have 67 percent predictability you know what i well i may agree with that as well but i would say that um i what i was saying is more along the lines of where we're tiering everything in the evidence hierarchy so i mean the current evidence hierarchy where people usually cite is they have rcts on the top then prospective cohort studies then cross-sectional studies retrospective a retrospective, then cross-sectional, then um, then animal data, mechanistic data, opinion, or, or case con- case series, case con- uh, cases, um, something along those lines. And all I'm saying is that there are ways of, on average, uh, looking at these things and seeing if really we can have a accurate evidence hierarchy. It doesn't mean in every single case one will trump the other. It just means. It's just looking at average. And it doesn't trump discussion either because discussion can happen because some prospective cohort studies, um, even if some prospective cohort studies are designed so poorly that maybe we wouldn't even look at the averages. We would just say, okay, this is clearly going to be one of those prospective cohort studies we can just toss out compared to something lower than that. Okay. Yeah. So now let's, I guess we can go on to the specifics. Um, so I don't think, do we still disagree on cost? Or do we did we come to an agreement on that? You, you want to stay yeah. say that again? You broke up for a second. Oh, there. sorry, sorry. Do we still disagree on copper, or did we come to an agreement on copper? I don't think we discussed copper, did we? You mean on, on Twitter? Twitter? On Twitter. Oh, um, I'm not sure we settled anything. I said that I would look at your studies, and I haven't done that oh, okay. yet because I'll yeah. probably do it like tomorrow. Or the- yeah, so the thing, I mean, the issue with copper for me is you know, coronaviruses die on copper surfaces. Um, sure. Um, Which was not the rationale for using the copper. What, what was specifically the rationale? The rationale, so the rationale was that, so first I pointed out that that's true. Copper probably has surface level virucidal activity toward um, the virus. But the primary rationale is explained in the two paragraphs that follow that. And the primary rationale is that um, there's roughly 80 milligrams a day of zinc recommended. And there have been, um, there's sort of a body of literature that's generally accepted among uh, zinc experts that's included even in the DRIs for zinc, that the acceptable ratios of zinc to copper range between two to one and 15 to one. And my reasoning here is that if there's several lines of evidence suggesting copper is toxic to the virus, you probably want to err, if anything, on the safe end of that range rather than the lower one. 
And so the ratio of copper um, that the amount of copper suggested to target, which is mostly suggested to come from food, is uh, is basically equivalent to being slightly on the higher end of the acceptable range of ratios that have been studied in human studies. Okay, where, then where did the whole thing about spraying copper in the back yeah, of the I'm throat I'm still confused come from? about the spraying the copper in the back of the throat then. Because like, if it's about uh, maintaining a nutritional ratio of copper to zinc, then I'm not entirely clear on how we get from that to spraying an aerosol copper into your mouth. Chris, you there? Oh, sorry, I forgot to because I was trying to find the uh, the quote from the. Hold on, one second. Okay, uh, I'm I'm realizing that my space bar while I'm talking is doing other things to scroll down in in my guide. So anyway, the ra the rationale for the spray was that um, was that. So first of all, it was it was suggested as it might be beneficial to add a small portion of the copper recommended in this form on the basis that it might have a relevant virucidal activity extracellularly um, in in the mouth and throat. And so I think one thing that's like up for grabs, and I I need to to like go back to the literature that's come out in the last week and see if there's anything that I can use to update this. But one thing that's not clear at, to me at all is whether there is an infection in the nose, mouth, and throat tissue. Um, I think based on ACE2 expression, there is ACE2 in the, um, in the oral and nasal mucosa, but it's all on the Basal uh, on the basal lateral side of the cells, and so it, in theory, it because it's not on the apical side facing the environment, it, the uh, cells in the oral and nasal mucosa are not going to act as targets for infection, um, and the cells in the lungs will. However, they're doing PCR um, tests that are that are basically acting pretty reliable, showing high amounts of the virus detectable in nasopharyngeal swabs. Um, so it appears that the virus is certainly found there and maybe it's infecting those cells. I, I'd have to go back to the newer research to see if I can figure any of that out. Um, but basically like it will probably have a topical or it, it, so I, the way that I see this is like, um, if it's relevant to have a virucidal activity there, then an ionic spray would probably have some virucidal activity there. And I think the the extracellular surface of the mouth or throat would be pretty analogous to a sur to a surface that's not in a biological organism. Okay, so there's a couple of things with that. Um, first thing is just because the ACE is expressed on the not on the apical side doesn't mean the viruses won't affect from uh, with ACE uh, just because they're not expressed on the apical side. Virons are pretty small particles. They may i mean i'm speculating just as well but they may just be able to get through the cracks to the to the lower side and just in, in get, latch on today it may not be the case that just be just because the ace is not expressed on the apical on that doesn't mean not going to infect the cells um, yeah they, and they could and would you would you say they could probably also um infect migratory cells in those tissues that are not those I, I'm not sure of the answer to that to that question, but it, the point being is that I, I wouldn't be su be surprised if yeah they do infect the throat cells. I wouldn't be surprised if that happens. Um, although it probably is an answer to that question. Although yeah, sy like symptom symptom wise, uh, it it appears that the lung is the primary site of infection, and the GI well, you tract cough. secondarily. With get, I mean, th there's there's cough that's that's well there's there's actually very very i mean here i actually spoke to id doctors about like an id doctor i had a podcast with an id doctor and a hospitalist on this and it's a lot what i've learned is that the symptom presentation is a lot more variable than we thought it would be um you want, you patients, want to state that again you you garbled oh outside. i hate sorry sorry my brain connection um <laughs> there's 
So the symptom presentation, yeah, the, the presentation of the symptoms we thought we would be, it's not just the cough. I'm, it's, not just, it's, it's not just the lower respiratory symptoms. There are patients who have been tested positive for COVID um, who started off with just, you know, upper respiratory uh, signs, may be less typical, but then, they've, uh, then it went to a lower respiratory infection. There are some patients who have presented with just GI symptoms. So there's a lot of variability in presentation, and it indicates that there may be a lot of variability in how the patients are presenting, uh, which may indicate variability in how the infection has started. So that's yeah. I, I, I my I have not kept up with the literature in the last week, and that's my intention to do um, mostly full time this week. But I was also wondering that this morning because I was reading a paper, the French paper that came out on the RCT on hydroxychloroquine. They classified some large percentage of the people as presenting with an upper respiratory tract infection, and they were yeah. they were using they were quantifying the viral load through nasopharyngeal swabs. Yeah. So it, yeah. So they. It, it, but when I when I wrote that when the guide came out, um, the state of the evidence at that point was contrary. Sure. So well, like, now like getting, I was saying on Twitter, though, like I was saying on Twitter, this seems to be a profound vulnerability when relying on mechanistic data. Is that it's very it's not very robust to error, and it's going to be like significantly more. Um, uh, open to amendment than other more robust forms of evidence. So giving recommendations based on based on recommendations that are so prone to error just seems somewhat irresponsible to me. Do you know, you know what I mean? I know what you mean, but I disagree with it on two bases. Um, first of all, I think I've been very upfront that there have been no clinical trials testing any of these things. And these are my best guesses based on the science at the time. But more importantly, part of my whole, you know, and I got a lot of flack for selling this for $10. A big part of that is because I'm trying to be able to put aside the time to stay up with the research. And I actually intend to give out free updates on the guide, uh, possibly at this point, now that several other things are off my plate, uh, at least once a week, if not twice a week. And so um, I think, you know, I think it's a big problem to make uh, recommendations that have a sense of permanence if they have a high likelihood of being overturned and they are not. Um, but I think it's, it, I think it's, um, I think it, it's much, it is responsible to make best recommendations given the uncertainty to tell people that's what you're doing and then to amend them uh, when there's a basis for amendment. But it, it's all, I, I know you've, you've stated to your audience that, this is your best guess and it's just speculation, but presenting it as though it is at all reliable when it is virtually completely untested is like the, the, the basis of my ethical objection. Well, I don't agree with it's basically untested. So I actually agree with what we were saying a few minutes ago that the appropriate thing to, that in, in theory, you could, you could quantify the pre predictive value of the evidence by saying, okay, if, uh, if in vitro antiviral activity is shown in the literature, this is the likelihood that will translate into an in, in vivo antiviral activity uh, in humans against that same virus. And then you could also quantify the in that um, you could translate across viruses. Like what, what is the likelihood that something shown in an RCT to be antiviral towards one virus translates to another? That has a probability associated with it. Um, and then you, I'm sure that you could come up with a better analysis where you could sum those, where you could adequately incorporate those into a model where if it has antiviral activity towards the virus in question, and it also has um, uh, in vitro, and it also has in vivo uh, antiviral activity towards other viruses in human trials, there's some probability ability associated that you with that that you would be able to predict that it would have antiviral activity towards a new virus and I don't know what that is but I don't think that it's um I don't think it's equivalent to not having evidence at all I think it's probably very far away from not having evidence well it's also true that like something could have antiviral like antiviral activity in vitro and something could have antiviral activity in vivo and 
you know, somebody who takes X, Y, Z supplements, uh, they all could have antiviral activity, but it still also could be the case that it makes no traction against infection rates or mortality. So you haven't, you know, like it, it could be the case that all of these things that you're saying are true, but it's not going to move the needle at the end of the day. Like that's also, that that's also a possibility. I agree. That's a possibility. Or move the needle in the opposite direction. Yeah, and it could just as easily move the needle in the opposite direction. Well, I'm, I don't know what the probability of that is, but I'm guessing that it's very low. I mean, what, what are some examples of antivirals that have been tested in, in humans and shown to have an effect against one virus that then turn out to be pro-viral in, uh, against a different... Well, it's not that it moves the needle in the opposite direction because it's pro-viral in one virus and antiviral in another virus. It could just be that the... Um, whatever there, it could be a there it could be a side effect profile that gets counterbalanced uh, by the countervailing benefits to one virus. Well, I, I okay, I agree with that. I agree with that, and I can actually offer an example of that. So, um, one thing that I think is is um very hard to navigate is the is the effect of interferon in um particularly yes, that's the in example SARS I was thinking of exactly. Yeah, interferon. Well, so so there's a great example of that in mice. If you delete the alpha beta interferon receptor, you can give those mice an otherwise lethal dose of the SARS virus, and they will live. Whereas you can give them an otherwise non-lethal dose of the influenza A virus, and they will die. So the effect of interferon in the context of the flu is to protect against the flu. The effect of interferon in the context of SARS, at least in SARS-infected mice, is to kill them. Um, and I and I think that you know one of the things that I did w was, and of course I have to update this because there's now emerging data from interferon treatments in COVID-19, but at the time there was not that was not available. Um, but one thing that I did is. And oh, I should also clarify the at least SARS and MERS, and I suspect um, uh, COVID nineteen. But I gotta, I have to see what's been published in the last week, tonight or tomorrow. Um, but at least with SARS and MERS, they have a very sophisticated w way of suppressing the initial antiviral interferon response, and then causing a massively increased interferon response that then causes lung damage later on. And so, my approach was. You know, we know this. If there are supplements that people are taking where we know the effect, where we know the antiviral activity is primarily mediated through effects on interferon, I would warrant strong caution against those because I think it's very unpredictable what they're going to do here. Um, and uh, and so, you know, I, I think, and I think that's I think that's reasonable in the context of remember, um, I put this out when there were already millions of people taking supplements um, in this case. And so my purpose here was not really to get people who are not taking supplements to think that they have to take supplements. My purpose he really here was to bring science to the table in terms of rather than just generalizing from the cold and flu, or rather than just generalizing from things that are supportive of the immune system, say, what do we know about the collection of supplements people already have on their list to take that we can say about one thing having, you know, being more likely to have a positive risk benefit profile and other things being things we should be more cautious with, knowing that millions of people are going to be taking some collection of things. That's what the primary purpose that I had in mind. And I absolutely stand by that in that I think it is much better to make some effort to study the specifics of the disease rather than to just blindly take things because they support the immune system or because they're effective against colds and flu. Yeah, I guess I think the only thing we're, the thing that would just um, strike all of us is I, I, and I, you've made some efforts to do this. You have, so credit for that. I mean, you're, you're not, you're not Joel Kahn who's peddling colloidal silver and is not making a, making the disclosures for all the harms that it will. Um, so credit for that. Um, the, the thing is just, uh, I guess just to, if I would just say anything, just to put more emphasis on just how much uncertainty there is and unreliability there is in these recommendations, you've done a good job in just saying they're not a replacement to things that do work, so that's good. Um, but really just to emphasize just, ha just how evolving this is and how 
the Switch can so easily flip with everything coming out, and that the T of these things, the point estimate of these things, where these things are, the effect size, we are so all over the place. And that doesn't mean we can't have these things and what we and what we think of them. It doesn't mean it's useless to make one of these uh, pieces of information. It's and it's it is within your right to sell it for money. Um, but just to emphasize how little confidence we really do have with such an emerging thing that's so novel and everything's going all over the place and in, in a field that's already pretty muddy of, of nutrition. I guess that's what I would say. Yeah. I mean, I agree with that. Uh, and that's, and I, you know, I've tried to be clear about the confidence and I've continually revised uh, the sales page on the basis of critical feedback where I wasn't doing a good job of that. And I think that at this point I've done a pretty good job of that, if not a very good job. Um, I would also point out that like the things that we know work, like even the public health recommendations are largely generalizations that are untested in this context based on mechanistic considerations. And I, you know, I think it would be a little bit slimy to just conflate the two because I think some of those generalizations have, really strong basis for making them. Um, I mean, but even washing your hands is a generalization from the germ theory of disease and the mechanisms of disease transmission. It's not something that's well, been it's tested. It's not just that. We've that we have but I think but I that. think well yeah we have well, yeah but no, I, I there are there are many no I think that relevant to like SARS CoV two like specific to hand washing. Like I think there's data about that out already. Yeah, but but some uh, I think some of the things are are still um, w okay. What's that? I think Nick said even in the case. No, what that... is what is what is the nature of the data that you're talking about, Nick? Oh, I mean, don't don't we already have like quantitative data about rates of infection as a function of hand washing? Specific to this virus? Do, yeah, I, I know we do on all sorts of viruses. I, I don't know specifically. Look, I'm not, I, I, I just, I just want to make it like super clear that I'm not trying to conflate the confidence that we have in that with the confidence of any kind of nutritional herbal supplements. I think it's, it's, I think it's night and day and black and white difference between those confidence levels. Um, I'm not sure that's the case with some other things like, but like, for example, like um, the effects of like whether people should wear masks or not. I mean, a lot of the advice that circulated about that, I'm pretty sure is based on mechanistic considerations of whether the thing aerosolizes, um, you know, and also economic concerns about the distribution of masks and stuff like that. But I don't think we have like clinical trials of mask wearing. No, I, I agree with that. I think the, I think the majority of the, I mean, I, I had a, uh, we did a Diet Wars podcast where we spoke to a hospitalist and an ID doctor. And the biggest concern with masks, like for if we're talking about just having everyone wear a mask, uh, the biggest, we're, there's not going to be an RCT. There are some ways of getting uncertain outcomes. So we can look to different, um, we can look to different cultures. So if you look at Asian cultures, there's going to be a lot of more people just in public wearing masks than there's going to be in the United States. And they seem to have done, of course, there were a lot of other factors that made them do better, but they seem to have been doing a bit better at controlling the virus than we are. Um, but the thing with masks here is just the concern is just distribution. Um, we are running out of masks. Oh, wait a second. In the healthcare are, are, wait a second. Are you, are you, are you, are you saying that because the Chinese use masks, that's why they've controlled the no. virus? No, no, no. I mean, they, no, they were also no. early on, they I'm were facing people Chris. around with drones saying, go, Chris, go lock your Chris. Yeah, yeah, Sorry. Chris, Chris, I, Chris, I, I've made it very clear that there are so many other factors involved in that. So, yeah, yeah. Okay. I, so. I think, yeah, yeah, there are many, yes, they, they've, sterilizing an entire town, an ent entire city is going to be also on the list of things that they've done. Locking everyone in their homes is going to be on the list of things they've done. <clears throat> in South Korea, uh, having an app to track everyone, uh, to have the government to, uh, make everyone take a, a, a COVID 100 meter app. Or if you test positive, you are you alert everyone else to your presence. If you're in 100 meters of them, um, that's going to have a factor. There are so many factors that are going to have. We don't have anything that will isolate the variable of a mask. 
Um, we do know that they are, th there is a different culture, and in, in certain cultures, Asian cultures, they do wear masks a lot more frequently than we do, as to what we really know exactly. When I spoke to... Which is basically not true in New York City anymore. Uh, New York City, a lot of people are wearing masks. I haven't seen, um, I haven't seen everyone, like, I don't even know if it's to the same degree of mask wearing. Um, I can't comment if it's the same degree of mask wearing or not. I see it frequently. And, um, RJS says there are, there are trials and nurse study comparing surgical mask and N95 and influenza infection. Okay. So maybe we do have some, some trials on masks and influenza, but maybe not on COVID-19 yet. In right, any but there's case, also, um, but there's also, there are also aren't recommendations that everyone walks around with an N95 mask. And like, I've listened right, to some right. interviews with people that have made the point that, for example, a, most people don't know how to put an N95 mask on. B, when you put it on correctly, it's really uncomfortable. It's going to like leave a dent in your nose and your uh, your face yeah. is going to be itchy later. You're probably going to stick your hands all over your face after you wear it because of that. I mean, there are very there are very reasonable like mechanistic right. speculations for why it's a bad idea to wear an N95 mask. Sure, sure, I I, I agree. And and the. And the other, well, the other thing is that we don't have enough N95 masks for the healthcare workers. But so the, I don't True. think all mechanistic, I don't think all mechanistic speculations are of equal ground. That's another thing I wanted to cover. Um, I think there are, and it's very hard to s separate different categories of mechanistic speculations. But I think there is a hierarchy even among mechanistic speculations. So, for example, um, if you are within the field of physics and this is a field where you could mechanistically speculate a lot better than in the field of nutrition. And the, I think the reason why that is, even if without, without RCT, so for example, you can predict the force of gravity on, some, on a planet that's far away, even if you don't test out how something is going to fall on, on the planet, certainly if you have the mass and everything, if you have the variables, um, because you know the laws of physics and you know the relevant um, factors that are going to be at play. You know, could there be some other mechanism? Maybe the air density is going to be a little bit different there. Maybe it'll follow us, right? Sure. Um, maybe there's something you're not accounting for, but it's very easy to pinpoint what the relevant mechanisms are that are going to take the most weight. Same thing if you shoot someone in the head with a, with a gun. Like you can say, okay, well, maybe the cranium is a little bit thicker here. Maybe like there's some mechanism you're missing where they, there's some like air wind or something. Generally speaking, it's pretty easy to know if you put a gun to someone's head and pop the trigger, you're not going to need an RCT to know that what the outcome is going to be there because the relevant mechanisms at play, you could have a much easier time at isolating the relevant mechanisms at play. I do think that's very different in the field of nutrition. In the field of nutrition, I think there are so many different mechanisms at play. Uh, and I think more important should be placed on outcome-based data because of that. Outcome-based data is that subsume all the mechanisms that are going in one way or another. Generally speaking, not in all cases, but generally. Does anyone disagree with that? No. No, I don't think I disagree with that. Okay, cool. Um, okay, so I guess... Okay, so now I guess the principles are covered and... Now, just to go, just to go over the copper thing, because I the only thing I really I haven't look full disclosure. I haven't. Is that your, that's your one objection to this? <laughs> yeah, I, I haven't. Well, well, to be honest with you, I haven't. I haven't. Um, I was supposed to be the mod. Hey, I was supposed to be the moderator here. It was supposed to be you and Nick debating, not me and you debating. <laughs> like I wasn't supposed to be the one having the objections, Chris. But anyway, um, my I and also I'll just say I haven't. Um, I have. I, I, I could have given you a copy your whole, of it if your, you yeah, get, yeah, 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 for sure. Um, and I'll I can go through it and give you feedback on it. Um, I mean, I could summarize it in two minutes. I'd be okay, sure. I'd be interested in that. Yeah, sure. Okay, so I think that the I think that the highest probability that something has an effect is elderberry extract on the basis that there are several randomized controlled trials showing that elderberry extract generally has an effect size of 50%. Um, in, in two cases, it was administered in the context of the flu and decreased the time, uh, the duration and sever duration and or severity of the flu symptoms by 50%. In another case, it was given to air travelers who were expected to have a high incidence of colds while traveling 
and it reduced the um, number of days spent being sick by 50%. So generally 50% effect size metric one way or another. And then on top of it, um, it uh, elderberry extract has uh, several in vitro studies at, at um, of antiviral activity against coronaviruses. And the one that I considered most important was showing that it is very strongly antiviral towards um, towards the first SARS virus. And um, not only does the first SARS virus have 87% proteomic homology with the virus that causes COVID-19, but it also is one of three known viruses that get into cells via ACE2 on the cell surface. And the one of the studies that looked at um, elderberry's effect on a coronavirus looked at the one of those. Uh, so there's SARS-CoV, SARS-CoV-2, and human coronavirus NL63 that use ACE2. They looked at the effect on that latter one that also uses ACE2, and they found that um, the caffeic acid and several other components of elderberry extract will bind to ACE2 and prevent the docking of the virus. And so I, you know, considering um, known safety profile uh, in vivo antiviral activity in humans tested in RCTs across two different viruses and the in vitro rele- uh, in vitro antiviral activity that was the um, most uh, against a virus that had the most um, mechanistic, uh, the, the most compelling reason to generalize across viruses with this one, given what we know know about mechanisms. Um, All that I thought summed to a high likelihood that elderberry extract could be potentially useful and safe. Then the second most important thing is zinc. I think um, at the time that I wrote the guide, my main concerns with zinc, when I say concern, the main reason I thought it was likely to be beneficial is that zinc has been shown to inhibit three proteins used in viral replication by the first SARS virus, which again is the most similar known virus to this current one. Um, and so it probably inhibits those replication proteins in uh, in this current one. I would say that this is somewhat being strengthened now, still on a kind of speculative basis in that um, some people are arguing that the effect of hydroxychloroquine and chloroquine, which is proving to have antiviral activity in actual clinical trials here, is that it has zinc ionophore activity, which helps zinc get into cells. And so one thing I'm researching right now is whether there are other natural compounds that have zinc ionophore activity. A lot of people are suggesting quercetin for this uh, impact. But in any case, that's the rationale for zinc. I don't think it's as strong as elderberry, but I think it's relatively strong. Zinc is known to, um, zinc at the doses recommended are known to be safe um, as long as they're, as long as you're not copy, causing a copper deficiency, which hence the reason for the copper. Um, zinc is generally known to be uh, supportive of the immune system. Uh, zinc deficiency is, you know, has a huge infectious disease risk. So overall, I think zinc would be safe and effective here. Um, the copper was mainly Chris, Chris, you cut out, put, put the push to talk button. Back on. Oh, sorry. You, you it cut was, out of copper. it was, yeah. it was copper. a space, it was a space bar effect again. Sorry. So the copper is meant to mostly balance the Z. Cut out again, Chris. Then the next, yeah, oh, sorry, sorry, sorry. Yeah. sorry, I'm just having trouble looking at, at my guide um, and also hitting my push to talk button at the same time. Oh, you can set a different push to talk button if it's causing you to skip. That's down. okay. I'm, that's okay. I'm, I'm almost done. So okay. um, garlic, I thought was um, sort of a step down from all of these in that there's no, um, uh, so there there's antiviral activity of Allison against many different viruses in vitro. There's like probably seven or eight different viruses that it's been shown consistently antiviral against. There is one trial using Allison derived from garlic to reduce the incidence of the common cold by 60 to 70%. And the mechanisms by which Allison has antiviral activity would appear to generalize to this virus. And so there's nothing specific to the virus, but all in all, it looks like a safe and effective thing to use um, some source of Allison. I'm personally, I'm taking. Is this, stabilized is this based on? Is this based on any outcomes, or is this just uh, so? Like the outcomes with the, the cold, el- the outcomes with the common cold. 
And this is like in terms of symptoms and uh, duration of disease or? This is in terms of reducing, I believe, the incidence of the common cold by 60 to 70%. I'd have to go back and look at the paper to see whether there were other multiple outcomes such as okay, cool. number of days. Um, every, right. every everything else, there's a few other things there. Those are all suggested as like p potential add-ons, with the concern basically being not messing with something that's known to have its primary effect on interferon for the reasons I discussed before. But that's the that that right there is like what I consider the critical components of what I was putting. Okay, so the thing I have, the thing issue it, I have with the copper. Um, I don't know. So it just seems like the copper is based on. I don't. I don't think the copper is based on the spray. The issue I had with the copper was the copper. Um, my issue with is a couple things. So the first thing is is the efficacy. So even if copper, um, which I believe the spray would have concentrations uh, to inhibit uh, SARS-CoV um, two, because just the concentrations are spectacular. They're they're very high in terms of molarity of the copper. Um, but even if that's true, um, when you spray them into your mouth and on the back of the throat. I don't think it's going to stay there. I don't think it's going to just line the throat topically and just stay there. I think the saliva is just going to wash it down and you're just going to swallow your saliva and it's going to go off. And then the next thing you know, I don't know how long it's going to take, but the next thing you know, you will have a throat that's not coated in copper anymore. And then I mean, you will. Yeah, that, that's like the whole point behind the drainage passage is that it helps clean the throat. And then you'll just have a throat that doesn't have copper on it anymore. And then you'll just have to perpetually spray your throat with copper wherever you're going just to have that protective, protective barrier of copper that'll kill a uh, virus landing there. So um, even, even, even when I wrote the guide, that was one of my least confident things. I said, you know, maybe it might be helpful to add a portion of the copper in this way. Um, I'm, I mean, like I, the copper thing, I could kind of take it or leave it like it's, um, I'm not really sure how effective it would be. I think it might be effective. Uh, I kind of doubt that it would cause damage to the mucous membranes if it's not being really irritating to people, but I'm happy to consider whether I'm wrong about that and change it. Um, and that's, a, that's an excellent question. Like what, I don't know what the change in copper concentration would be over time. I mean, basically the copper ions would probably need at least a minute to have a strong virucidal effect, but I'm not sure. So like the copper alloy surfaces, um, they, they generally take like five to 30 minutes to kill something. But the whole rationale for the time it takes is the time it takes for the copper to ionize from the surface. So my suspicion is that like ionic copper solution would probably be strongly virucidal in much less than a minute of contact time. But um, yeah, I, 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 I just don't know. I think it's an excellent question of how swallowing would affect the the time at which the copper concentration stays high. Well, in the here's, throat. here's, there's a bigger issue here um, with the, and we're not even talking about harms yet. We're talking about efficacy. The bigger issue with efficacy is, well, there's two things. So there's the time at, there's the, when the virus comes to contact with the cells of the throat, um, that's when you need the copper to be there. Once the viruses have already infected the cells, they're intracellular now. So the copper would have to actually penetrate the cells themselves in order to get to the virus to be meaningfully um, virucidal once the infection has already taken foothold. So I want to I want to clarify that I suspect that copper's virucidal activity is going to mostly be extra. Yeah, ex exactly. So then the issue with that is, so if the, vir if the virucidal activity is extracellular, then it needs to stay extracellular. It needs to stay where it is. It needs to, so you need to spray the copper on the back of the throat, and it's got to last there. Because people, think about how people are going to practically do this. They take copper, they spray it in the back of their throat, and then they go about their, let's say they go to whatever exposure. They have an exposure event. Um, and then you have a person who does not spray copper in the back of the throat and goes to the same exposure event. If the copper is not there anymore, if you know th there's natural drainage, there's natural swallowing, your mouth produces saliva, the copper is going to get swallowed into your stomach. Um, if the copper is not there anymore in both cases, 
the event is just going, the exposure event's going to have to carry the same risk for both people, even though one sprayed copper and one didn't. And so the relevant query for the exposure event would be how long does this copper last when you spray it to the back of your throat? And then the other thing, the caveat here is just if the infection has already taken hold, if you're symptomatic already, spraying copper to the back of your throat is likely not going to help because it's already intracellular at that point. Well, I don't know if I agree with that. I mean, aren't the viruses going to exit from one cell to another while they're replicating? Or not while they're replicating. Yeah, but that doesn't have they're... to be that doesn't have that doesn't have to be an apical surface though. That doesn't have to be through the apical surface. Is that never in the apical surface? The copper? No, the exit of the replicated virus. What, what Avi is saying is think... that uh, the virus doesn't necessarily have to leave through, like the throat side of the cell. Like it could be, it it, it could oh, just yeah, be clearly. hacky sack exactly, between yeah. cells. Yeah, exactly, and that is yeah. But, uh, yeah. but no, isn't, isn't this isn't this mostly a, a probability function of this encountering some proportion of the virus? I'm not. Sh I'm actually not sure. Even if that is the main, even if the apical way is the main way the virus spreads, as opposed to um, non-apical ways. Um, so I would ha actually have to look more into that. I think we all would have to look more into that. But the, the, also the thing is, whatever amount. I think I, the biggest concern I have here is just the duration of time, even on the apical surface. I think the duration of time on the apical surface is just going to be really low, and I don't think it's going to make much of a difference. I think you're just going to swallow the copper into your stomach. Yeah, that's possible. But I mean, remember the primary rationale for copper in this entire thing was to get oral copper into the stomach for the purpose of balancing the systemic effects of the zinc. Okay, that's and different. So, that's, that's a whole different well, thing. Well, so yeah. what I said was basically, I'm not sure if it would have a beneficial effect, but it might have a beneficial effect to get a small portion of that copper as a couple sprays of this. And so, I mean, you're, I, I really have no issue with you critiquing the likelihood of effect because I never was thinking of it as a primary part of the protocol. It was sort of like a footnote to a footnote. Like the, it's the zinc and not the copper that has a rationale for a active antiviral in vivo activity. And the copper is like a footnote to the zinc because you need to balance it. And the spray is like a footnote to the copper because like maybe this would happen. Okay, um, that's okay. That's fine. And so, so yeah, I, I, so it's 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 very possible that I should consider removing it. Um, I, I think to for me to be like highly motivated for to research copper as the next thing, rather than looking at um, like the clinical trials that have been done in the last week and looking at hydroxychloroquine and looking at zinc ionophores and stuff like that. Um, I would need to be fairly convinced that it was a like risky thing. And so I, I, I do I do believe I will find time um, in the next couple of days to look at the papers that you showed me on potential harm to the mucosa. Um, but I just I mean, wouldn't uh, what's you what is your opinion on the likelihood that someone is doing significant harm to their mucosa if it if it doesn't prove irritating to them? Yeah, I, I if it doesn't prove ir if they're actually spraying copper into their throat and they're, it's not irritating to them. They're, the only co the concern I would have is long term use. Uh, some things could be ir not irritating acutely, but irritating in long term use. That makes I, sense. I guess the biggest con yeah I guess and the biggest concern, um, especially now that we have a COVID outbreak and the models are indicating this is going to last for like six months or whatnot, in six months. Um, so I would be concerned with people s s not seeing acute effects and seeing long term use effects. Because well, I well I agree with that, but I mean, I I also have full intentions of rapidly updating this. And sure. when I was writing this, I was I was presuming that this was going to be real high intensity for three or four weeks, and maybe be relevant for three months. And the the predictions of a much longer impact were not out at the time that I was writing this. And so even something like the elderberry, I. One of my things was like, should you wait until you think you might be sick to use this or should you take it all the time? And the preventative studies with elderberry used between 700 and 900 milligrams of elderberry extract. 
Um, and none of them lasted 12 weeks, but there was one that used the elderberry extract in a completely different topic that used a thousand milligrams for 12 weeks and didn't have, um, and didn't have any kind of, uh, safety risk to it. And so my rationale was, you know, even though the cold and flu research is generally two or three week studies, we generally know that elderberry is generally safe over the course of 12 weeks. And so the, you know, the, the dose that is shown to have preventative effect would be the right dose. Um, and then I said in the guide, like when this is less of a threat, like either reduce the dose or eliminate it. Um, but yeah, I mean, if this is going to be something that's going to be high threat for six months, then one of my concerns will be, well, how will I revise this in terms of, you know, what, what are the additional safety factors of doing something like this for six months instead of a couple of weeks? Yeah. And then the only other issue I had with the, the copper spray is that the molarity is astronomical. Um, it's, it's higher than, even when you, when, when looked at the, I would, I, I, look, here's the thing with the molarity. The molarity is very high in this spray. It's going to dilute very quickly, I suspect, in the mucosa because there's saliva and there's secretions and everything. I don't know to what degree that will dilute and what, this question just hasn't been really, I don't think there's data really answering this question. The uh, things that are non-irritant are just far lower than that molarity. Uh, things. Do you, that do you are, think it's a re- Do you think it's like a reasonable way to deal with it? Is say like if you find this irritating, um, stop, and don't carry this on longer than X amount of. I think that's a lot more reasonable than just rec- than not including. Um, I, I really, it's so, it's so, I just, this is very out of left field for me, Chris. I mean, it's just like the spring copper in the back of the, thro- the throat. Is this something people do? Like, is this? Well, for me, I mean, probably, people- probably, probably not. But for me, what I was thinking of was my experience with zinc lozenges, where zinc acetate lozenges are designed to deliver zinc ions to the um, adenoid, to, to, to the nose and the lymph tissue of the nose and throat. And it there it uh, interferes with the docking of rhinoviruses to ICAM one, which is their docking protein. Um, and the trials are uh, there. I mean, there are some ambiguity around the trials, but I think there uh, there are a couple of analyses that I cited in the guide um, suggesting that when the right formulation is used in the right way, the effect can be very powerful. And my personal experience is also the case with that. So then I had a secondary concern, which was that the zinc acetate lozenges that are made by uh, Life Extension, which is the only people that make them correctly, according to those analyses, um, were back ordered until April. And so I was like, well, what am I going to do in the meantime? And in my past experience, I find that uh, dropping ionic zinc, if I don't have the zinc acetate lozenges into my throat, appears to be effective, but it seems like it's only effective if I do it like very frequently at very small doses to keep the concentration there. And that really goes back to the point that you were making about, you know, you spray this in your mouth and you swallow it. So it's gone. And one of the points about the zinc acetate lozenges is that they have to be designed to be sucked on slowly so that the sort of like a third of your time in the day is spent sucking on a zinc acetate lozenge. It's like the only way that it'll be effective. Right, right. Um, And so this was kind of like, I was like, well, I mean, yeah, I mean, this is very out of left field. I was like, if this is the best way to compensate for a shortage of the zinc acetate lozenges, why not do a little bit of copper as well? Yeah, that's so I guess, okay, so here's my, so my concern, like my judgment at this point, point is that again going to be my leaning there's no date on this but based on my concerns of harm versus the my speculation for benefit uh given that you're just going to swallow it and we don't even know if it's going to stay there you probably um once it's uh intracellular it may have have less of an effect if at any at all um and the amount of time that it is on there it starts off at a very very high molarity um what we've seen with copper ingestions in toxicology we see mucosal ulcerations even in the esophagus they've seen mucosal ulcerations although they probably had even higher concentrations because some people take certain crystals that contain copper and that's been happening although not all cases i don't think all cases of toxicology have seen mucosal ulcerations from crystals so 
they can ulcerate. They may ulcerate over time. There are certain data on uh, environmental exposure to copper, although they were also inhaling the copper because. But they also have mucosal ulcerations. That may happen over time as well. So I don't know if the advising people to just do this, and if you know if you don't get irritation from it, but like don't wait till you get irritation from it because like some ulcerations can happen slowly over time. The mucosa can thin over time. And you may not even notice it because each change is, is small. And before you know it, like all of a sudden, you when you do experience symptoms, it's too late. You have an ulcer. And just that, along with just how unlikely I think this is to substantially help, just because it's not going to topically stay there, especially from what we know with zinc lozenges, I would just, I really would recommend to just take the spray thing out. Well, given how adamant you are about this and how little i feel like defending it i'll consider it a high priority to potentially take out uh pending reviewing the research that you had sent to me okay cool um yeah and then the only other thing from my end is just to really, really emphasize just how things are changing all the time and and how um yeah the confidence of this is low and and that's uh, that's really my my issue because that's my take um because and i haven't just disclosed i haven't fully read the thing but i i'd be happy to and i'd be happy to talk more about after fully reading it um nick uh do you have anything um because this really was about you and chris and i feel bad as someone who's been putting in input uh to sort of take over the conversation Oh, no, no, no. I actually appreciate it because I, I, I know in private conversations, you and I were kind of as one on this topic. So I have no problem letting you speak for me here, given how tired I am. <laughs> but, yeah, so I, before but Chris and I have already gone over the like we already went over it on Twitter. And I think we we're just coming from two completely different axiomatic places in terms of how we um, how we qualify the ethics on me on that front. Okay. All right. So we can, we can wrap up the conversation here then. Um, so good. yeah, yeah. So we can go. So yeah, basically my inputs are just like to really, really emphasize how little we know about this and how things are changing. Um, I re yeah, really would strongly recommend against the, I, again, I haven't read this thing, but I've, I've, I, based on what you've told me about the copper spray, I would recommend against the copper spray for now, just because the bent, just because how the benefit, the risk to the the benefit risk analysis. Um, I just don't see how it would pan out. Um, I'm happy to read the rest, and we can pick up the conversation another time. Um, and then, and then the uh, the real the real long term discussion, I think, is just and really what we need to know for the future for nutrition for everyone. And not this is not going to happen during the COVID nineteen outbreak, but really just to kind of get a better objective way of evaluating the evidence high place and what should not, because there's a lot of disagreements on the evidence hierarchy. Um, I am more confident than others on the evidence hierarchy, but it's very good to have an objective standard. Like once you pick RCTs as a standard to really solidify on average the where different things tear out in terms of how confident we are that they can approximate reality. And that's really where I think things need to go, especially in a field like nutrition. Yeah, but anyway, you definitely, you definitely need like a systematic approach or else you're just flying yes. in your pants and just doing whatever the hell you want. And that has dangerous consequences. And this is the, this is the, so much of what we see, not to point any fingers at anyone, but so much of on Nutrish, Nutrish Twitter is such a cancer show. Um, with <laughs> just replete with this where it's just like, I have no, like, Yes, you need a systematic way of evaluating things, of tiering things. And you can make symmetry breakers between different parts of the evidence hierarchy, but it needs to be applied consistently. Like, logical consistency is just so important. I'm going to be preaching to the choir on it. Um, but yeah, it was great talking with all of you. Yeah, I enjoyed Thank it. Thank you for the opportunity. It was fun. Yeah, let's do this again sometime. I'm sure we can take apart a lot of topics. Let's do it. All right, cool. And uh, thank you for the Ask Yourself server for hosting us, and thank you to Ask Yourself for recording.